the seatbelt sign, the seatbelt sign is on. Uh, there's no room in the overhead. Actually, there is no room in the overhead compartments. We're totally full. This is so exciting. Um, full house, I, full hearts, empty mind. <laughs> you, you said empty mind. You looked at me. Do you know, you do, you know me well enough? This is... Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to talk for maybe three to four minutes and then probably not talk for the rest of the time because if you bought a ticket to come to South by Southwest to hear me talk instead of Paul or Julie, um, you, do, you need psychedelic assisted therapy. <laughs> um, which could be a way to, you know, increase the market size. Um, so, uh, thanks. Thanks for everyone for coming. Uh, I actually got personally shut out of Paul's talk yesterday. I was so excited. And I saw all these people in line, and I thought to myself, well, at least we'll have somebody come see us today. And I'm, I'm really happy to see everybody. How many people were at yesterday's talk? I'm just curious. Oh, OK, good. All right. How many people were shut out? OK. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some introductions, because if I let, them I let Paul and Julie introduce themselves, they probably won't be as um, kind to themselves as, as I might be as a fanboy. So I'm Daniel Goldberg. I'm a co-founder of Palo Santo. We're a, psychedelic, we're a fund, venture capital fund focused on psychedelic therapeutics. We did, we did have kind of a busy day yesterday. There was a small uh, banking crisis going on, apparently. I, I don't know who's in bad shape. We have no idea. We're calling around. But it's very interesting because I think this is the moment right now, one of many, where if you are from, and I'm going to poke fun of my friends in L.A. and Austin specifically, that maybe say money is energy or energy is money, that's not going to fly with Silicon Valley Bank. <laughs> and and, I, and I, I might be making light of it. This is, the, this is a moment where, you know, you may want to, like, Check in with your friends who are in business because it's it's a very scary thing. So I'm just gonna just gonna put put that right there. Wh what that really means is I had no time to prepare. I went to the pool and I wrote up some notes. I'm gonna say them and then I'm gonna pass it over to Paul and Julie. So I am a bit less organized than usual uh, because of yesterday, and it's a juxtaposition to uh, my my co-founder um, Tim Schlid, who had a panel a couple hours ago, which was which was brilliant. Who's incredibly organized. This may feel a little bit more like a psilocybin journey. Uh, in, in its scope. So, uh, his, part, his, his was called To Trip or Not to Trip, and it was with some of the OGs in psychedelic science. I just want to call out a few things. Um, we heard from, among others, David Nichols, who mentioned uh, he's un, pretty much unparalleled in the history of psychedelic science, and Dave uh, reminded us that we lost decades of progress during Nixon's drug war. And this field today, uh, I, I'm lucky enough to have been welcomed into a few years ago uh, may seem a bit tribal at times. There's a lot of, uh, I was here first, uh, I notice. Um, and uh, there are many elders in the space that are, that I'm not pointing at you because you'll see where I'm going here, that may be a, a bit scared of where we're going and what all this means. But in my opinion, uh, the train has left the station and, and we're very lucky uh, to have so many elders in the psychedelic movement. By the way, I'm sorry if I'm calling you an el either of you an elder. I'm 50. You're not sorry. Uh, I, I, I don't like uh, where any of this is going. All right, ready? It's almost over. Uh, welcoming, welcoming, welcoming new voices, new talent, new ideas to advance their work to the next level. And no one represents that kind of inclusivity. Inclusivity. Is that a word? And generosity more than Paul Stamets and Julie Highland. Um, you're in for a treat. Uh, Julie is, if you don't know her, and now you do, is a psychiatrist, psychopharma psychopharmacologist, psychopharmacologist, all one word, not psycho and pharmacologist, psychopharmacologist, <laughs> author, and has been one of the more important advocates for the psychedelic movement. All around, one of the coolest people you'll meet in this space. I actually wrote that down because I was afraid I missed that. And the vast majority of the time, um, she doesn't even let it get to her head. And uh, Paul... <laughs> It feels like an understatement to call Paul Stamets the world's most famous mycologist. He is an author, medical researcher, and an entrepreneur, an intellectual, and industry leader in fungi, habitat, uh, medicinal use, and production. Uh, today, Paul is a bit of a rock star. Um, his message resonates with new audiences all the time. Um, he's brought what most people would think of as an esoteric topic to life. And when I listen to him speak, I personally get filled with a sense of hope, optimism, and, and also, I, I, I love that there's always a call, call to action, which is, which is 
very, very meaningful. Um, so, okay, why are we talking about psychedelics uh, in the media? Uh, undoubtedly, the movies and books over the past five years brought in audiences we could have never imagined. That's where I found my entry into the space. And I, I'm gonna turn it over, but real quick, bullet speed, raise your hands if you've seen Fantastic Fungi. Okay, and raise your hands if you've seen How to Change Your Mind on Netflix, and if you've read the book, for really, if you've read the book. <laughs> Everyone lies about reading books. Uh, Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia, the series. Dosed. Fr dosed. From shock to awe. Have a good trip. Psychedel Psychedelia. The history of science and the mystical. Uh, uh, nine perfect str Why did that again? Reefer Madness. What? <laughs> books. How to change... How to, okay. Doors of Perception. Ayala Waldman. Really good day. I'm almost done. Julie Holland. Good chemistry. Raise your hands. Everyone raise your hands. Um, and the last one... Oh, Mycelium running, you're in trouble. All right, so I want to pass this over to you guys. That was the, that was the longest intro you'd, you'd ever expect, but I wanted to set it up. Paul, what does this all mean to you when it when when this how, when did that shift feel? When Paul, I'm going to start with you. Julie's like a co-moderator. I have questions for Julie, but she's going to interrupt. She's going to come up with some content too. But Paul, I, I am very curious because you've been in this for decades. Um, I think you wrote. You, did you did you? Write your your first first book in in 1976. Is that right? Well, I started my first book when I was 19, okay. and it was published in 1978, uh, 45 years ago. Psilocybe mushrooms and their allies, which is a I studied uh, taxonomy, created taxonomic keys. Found well, the Stropheria AC is a it's a family that contains three genera: Stropheria, Psilocybe, and Hyphaloma or Nematoloma. These are all you know, sister species. This is why it was called Stropharia cubensis, then it became Psilocybe cubensis. As Stropharia's have a, a annulus, a ring on the stem. So, yes, I started very young. Most people know the story. My brother John inspired me, and then my friend Ryan's father found my brother John's book, Altered States of Consciousness, and burned it. And that really inspired me when I was 14 to, to take up the subject. And I wanted to impress my brother John, and he came back from Colombia and Mexico with amazing tripping stories, and I was 14 years of age. He went to Yale, so he was part of his training there, so to speak. Um, but let me just put this in. We're talking about the media and films and books. What are these? These are stories. These are narratives. And indigenous cultures through millennia, you know, these stories you know, have been told and retold generationally, passing on knowledge. We have new media to tell these stories. You know, we have the internet, we have books, we have, you know, um, you know films, et cetera. Uh, but the songs and the legends and the tales that were told over generations were the media of those times. So I feel for myself, and I think I can include Julie on this, is that we are voices today who are one in a long, you know, we're in a long lineage of experts, of uh, psychedelic experts that are carrying this knowledge forward. What's unique about psilocybin mushrooms, to put it in perspective, and I mentioned this yesterday, you know, we only know which mushrooms are edible or poisonous from the people who've eaten them before us. <laughs> so that's literally, well, that's true with plants, that's true with frogs. Some frogs are edible, some, some are deadly poisonous. And so what's unique about mushrooms is how ephemeral uh, they are. They're only in your viewscape for a few days and they rot. Whereas animals and plants are in your viewscape, in your event horizon constantly. You see them frequently. And so you have a familiarity factor. With familiarity, you have confidence in whether they're friend or foe and how to deal with them. With mushrooms that come up, some can feed you, some can kill you, some can heal you, some can send you on a spiritual journey, and they disappear for a year. What was that? or for several years. And so the cognoscente in indigenous cultures that were um, you know, experts, mycologists, and I li really like to give a shout out to Maria Sabina, and especially Valentina Wasson also. Both these women, you know, uh, Maria Sabina was, was a shaman, everyone knows that, and, and maybe people don't know that Valentina Wasson was a Russian doctor. But they indeed were mycologists. They could go into the wilds, into the woods, into the fields, and find mushrooms and be able to safely identify many of them. Now, there's over 14,000 species identified in a, in a genome of over 150,000 estimated in a kingdom of about 2 million fungi. 
most of which have not been identified. So it's not like they knew every mushroom, but they knew enough to be able to you know, collect them and give them in ceremony or medicinally. And so these two women are really the, the pioneers that just catalyze this movement to bring it to us today. So I, I feel like I shepherd this responsibility being a powerful voice in this time. But in 1975, when I attended my, 1974, 1975, I attended my first mycological congress. Um, there was a photograph I think someone showed. I had really long hair and a really long beard. I went through puberty really early, <laughs> really early. Um, so when I went to these congresses and whatnot, I was treated like a leper. I, I kid you not. I walk into a crowd of people, and it's like there was this a, a force field of repulsion. And there would be like a circle of 20 feet away from me. Whenever I walk up to a group of people, they would distance themselves, you know, uh, fearful that I was interested in magic mushrooms. That confirmed their fears. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but fortunately, Dr. Daniel Stuntz, the University of Washington, because I was very interested in taxonomy, and they were, were surprised constantly to be confronted with psilocybin mushrooms. He had studied mushrooms for 40, 50 years before I met him, had never seen these psilocybin mushrooms, and suddenly they're everywhere. And it's because of wood chipping, landscaping in the 60s in particular, using decorative bark around buildings. And then when everyone went to Mexico, and, and there are some psilocybin mushrooms are rare, but liberty caps were fairly well known. But they were hard to identify as well for many mycologists even, because they don't bruise bluish. Most of the psilocybin mushrooms are purple round spores and they bruise bluish. Liberty caps do not, they grow on pastures. And so they, when he, Dr. Daniel Stuntz realized that I had, I had embedded myself into the subject and we found going to libraries, I couldn't find many of the references. Uh, you go to the bibliographies, all of you know this, you, go to the, you look at the bibliographies, the references, you find a reference, oh, I'm gonna look up that reference and you couldn't find them because all the, the books and the libraries, the papers have been razored out with anything on psilocybin mushrooms. So I went to Daniel Stunt saying, you know, I need this reference, this reference, this reference and he's going, wow, this, this guy's you know, pretty learned about this subject. And so he took me into his private library at the University of Washington uh, Botany Department. And so I spent many, many hours, I joined the Pacific Northwest Key Council. They elected me as vice president of the Key Council, which is a great honor for me, my first being elected uh, into a group. Um, and I led, you know, there was about 40 or 50 of us um, that were writing taxonomic keys to it's literally mushrooms. I'm sorry, species. I'm sorry, Paul. I think your time might be up. I'm not sure what's going on. <laughs> That's all the time we have today. Can, I'm using my psychiatrist voice. Can you tell? Um, okay, I think I'll stop there. I think do you do you have a clip? Stop. Do you Pardon? have a clip to show? Is that why it got dark? No, in here? no, there's no clip. I said, no. do you have a clip to show, no, or did no. it just get dark in here for no, fun? No, no. I, I think somebody's I leaning against the light switch. This. This is not me. If anyone's no. leaning against any light switches, um, thank right, you we'll for going. unleaning. Should we just continue, even though we're all yeah, seeing I think the dark? So. I think That'll so. be fun. The mics are working. Oh, and the journey, and you should, you guys should be coming out of the trip right about now. How is it, uh, that's about it. Look, look, okay, I think I'll stop. That's a good time. I thought it was a signal for me to no, stop. No, 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 no. no we were jo she was joking. I don't know. It was a, okay, I think, no. so, well, I think that's, you know, that's, that was my beginning, and then I had some heroic journeys, and yeah. I think a lot of us, I always like to ask, and this is going to be a fun question to ask this audience, how many people in this audience have not tripped on psilocybin mushrooms? Uh, seven, eight, nine, maybe ten. Ten out of 250. You're a minority. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm so glad I mentioned that because I do want to mention one other thing. In innovation, and this is very much the, one of the epiphanies that I've had, and it's not a big one, folks. Everyone sort of knows this. It's so important to protect the minorities and minorities of opinion. It's the minorities of opinion that drive innovation, not conventional wisdom. It's the edge runners, the people who push the envelope, the people who are different, the people who are strange, the people who may be alien to your, you know, your religion or, or what you're, you're used to. You're in your, they're outside of your comfort range. But when you think about the giant leaps in science, you know, and the exploration, it is always the edge runners, the minority of people that push the envelope. 
And so I'm a blend of being a liberal and a conservative. I'm a conservative in many ways. But conservatives want to conserve, supposedly, you know, traditionally, the safeguards that have gotten them to where they are, they feel safe, you know, insecure. Well, the people who are on the margins, who are pushing the envelopes, are challenging to the safety net that's been created by conventional uh, wisdom, religion, etc. So this is really a shout out to everyone who are minorities. Minorities racially, culturally, sexually, we need you. You are the vanguard of innovation that has propelled our societies into the future. So all of you who feel marginalized, I mean, from my point of view, you are the great heroes of this movement. You're the ones who are leading the way by your courage and the fact that you are different. I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, Julie. Um, how many more people have been brought into this movement since, say, 2017 or 18, right, on a percentage basis? And the messaging, right, from, from the media, from the movies, from, I'm talking about the, the really, you know, we're talking Joe Rogan, Fantastic Fungi, you know, these, these huge outlets, right, of storytelling. And I'm curious, has your, message, has your messaging changed since, say, 2017? No. And how do you feel about my, it? Here's my short answer is no. My messaging hasn't changed since 1985. Yeah. Um, my messaging, at, when we first learned about HIV in 85, I, I wrote papers about... Uh, giving condoms to everybody, giving clean needles to everybody. This seems like it's the very least we can do. And at that time, I was a vanguard, and, and a lot of people were not comfortable with what I was saying. And then I experienced MDMA for the first time in 1985, and I, uh, I went on television talking about it, um, like a local morning show, AM Philadelphia. And that was not my first exposure to media, but uh, the... It's, it's always been my goal to uh, educate about the potential of the drug and the harm associated, and it's always going to be that balance. Um, and there is a little pendulum swinging, but uh, lately things have been swinging uh, toward <laughs> transgressions and us talking about those transgressions and boundary violations. Um, you know, people in a very vulnerable state when they are tripping, and it's important that the people around them are trustworthy, and uh, dare I say, even sort of have good energy or auras about them. So I'm always happy to focus on harm reduction, but I, you know, why are we talking about this? Because there's a lot of potential, because there's a lot of benefit. Um, my first book back in 2001 was about MDMA. It was called Ecstasy, The Complete Guide, and that's a nonprofit book to fund MDMA research. And then I did a book called The Pot Book, Complete Guide to Cannabis, also nonprofit funding clinical research. Um, my most recent book is about psychedelics, and I'm actually doing a book signing right after this, right down the hall. We'll do one of it. This is, so yeah. if anybody... Uh, this is a great book, if I do say so myself. Um, it's called Good Chemistry, The Science of Connection from Soul to Psychedelics. And there's plenty of harm reduction in there, but there's also uh, plenty of sort of proselytizing about uh, connection and the sort of fundamental benefits to your body and your mind um, that come from being connected. Uh, feeling you're part of something bigger than you, feeling like everything is connected. Um, and these are the kind of experiences you can have with psychedelics, is a sense of connection. You can, uh, don't forget cannabis is a psychedelic, so even like a little tiny bit of cannabis, and you might find that you feel more connected to your own body or to nature. And if you have a slightly larger dose, you may feel connected to the universe. And certainly if you have larger doses of psychedelics, you're gonna have that sense of everything being connected, of, of being part of something bigger than you. And th those kind of awesome experiences are not just good personally, I would say that they're good for our society and our culture. So I try to write about those things, I try to talk about those things. Um, I've been on the Today Show 26 or 27 times, not always talking about psychedelics, but almost always educating people about drugs, good and bad, and occasionally educating about psychiatric conditions if a celebrity happened to have a manic episode or something. Um, 
I'd like to personally thank uh, Charlie Sheen and Lindsay Lohan for selling my book, Weekends at Bellevue, so, so nicely for me for an extended period of time. Uh, most recently, I was actually given eight minutes on Kelly and Ryan, which if any of you uh, watch morning TV, like that was a double segment. And first of all, I was pretty excited. Kelly and Ryan is like, it's a Disney company. It is about as mainstream as you're gonna get on a morning show. And uh, what started out as, well, we just wanna talk about alternative therapies for depression, ended up at eight minutes talking about macrodosing, microdosing, ketamine, I began ayahuasca, as much as I could get in in those eight minutes. Mm. So one of the things, uh, it's important, anybody here who's doing media, is you, the signal noise ratio really matters. You know, you have to kind of come up with sound bites that hopefully won't be taken out of context. I did a podcast this morning. I had the worst sound bite. I'm like, here, here's your terrible sound bite. I was talking about how um, what, when Sanjay Gupta educated people about CBD and THC through the CNN documentary Weed, I was very involved in that documentary. And I basically taught Sanjay's producer about CBD. And then I spent an hour having an interview with Sanjay explaining about CBD and epilepsy. And they ended up doing a documentary where they showed like two-year-old babies having seizures. And it really convinced people uh, that CBD could be helpful. You know, these kids got better. Charlotte Figgy got better. Um, excuse me, Charlotte Figgy. Um, and you know, you, you cannot make jokes about, about seizing babies. Um, and yet, today on a podcast, I managed to, because I was talking about how the issue of veterans needing help is very bipartisan. And there aren't that many things these days that are bipartisan. Um, firefighters, NYPD, any PD, police, I'm sorry, I'm New York-centric. I worked at Bellevue for nine years, and I interfaced a lot with NYPD, EMS, and a group of people called ESU, which are emergency services units, kind of who police call when they call 911. All those people are traumatized. All those people need help. Veterans are traumatized. They need help. These things are uh, bipartisan. And, and my terrible soundbite, I'm just so glad to share it for you now. Yeah, just, uh, just put like, it out there again. We'll I was like, you know, <laughs> the veterans are like the new seizing babies basically. So it's terrible, right? It's terrible soundbite. Don't say that. But the idea is that there are certain stories that are sticky that we care about and we pay attention yeah. to. We care about sick kids. We care about first responders who are traumatized. We care about veterans who have literally put their lives on the line, I'm not speaking metaphorically, who come back and are in very bad shape. And so these are bipartisan things. So, um, the, one more thing I just want to say. So, um, so I, I do a lot of nonfiction books. I talk on uh, TV shows. I'm a talking head on a million documentaries. I'm working right now on something scripted, which is a lot harder. Uh, it's harder to sell something scripted. I, I imagine the person I'm working with is not in the audience, but we sort of decided that we would announce it at South by Southwest. Um, if anyone here saw Station Eleven, I loved Station Eleven, fell in love with it. Uh, got in touch with the executive producer who's very interested in psychedelics, wants to do a scripted show about psychedelics. Uh, his name is Scott Steindorf. We are working together to try to, to, try to create something scripted. Uh, we're not the only team trying to make scripted material about psychedelics. It's another opportunity to educate people, you know, to, pu to put the harm reduction messages in there, uh, to try not to be too clickbaity. Uh, I'm taking a break. No, that's good. No, and I think the story. Getting back to stories, uh, I, I, there was a time. I'm I'm from Chicago, the Chicago area, and it seems to be a. It was a bit of a, a, a desert in terms of psychedelic knowledge. There's just I don't think a, a, most of the universities weren't there, weren't involved in in you know there weren't too many big names or trials going on. At universities it was pretty pretty quiet, and so I was. Uh, it was it was a while coming out of the psychedelic closet, as they say. I noticed when that moment happened that those stories. Uh, that I was telling had a big impact, like, who am I, right? I'm telling, like, whispering to a few people here and there. But I, I saw how that filtered down. I would recommend different books and different movies to different people. So it was, and this is, you know, it was like, started with How to Change Your Mind, and then Fantastic Fungi came out. And I remember uh, bringing my wife to, to see it, um, and she wasn't that into the, the topic of psychedelics at the time. So I was like, it's mush it was mushroom, I don't know, it's the Gene Siskel Film Center, come on. And it, and it had a huge impact. And then your book for women, certain women in my family and friends that I was just like, oh, 
this is a cool little book. It kind of talks about psychedelics. So I think each story in each film, in each book, in each media appearance can speak to different, you know, has spoken to different people. And I, I, I yeah. Well, I, I think this is an intergenerational movement. When we were growing up, you know, our parents, you know, the, were not in the psychedelics, and now you see multiple generations that are sharing. A lot of people, I have the motto that many people know, nature provides, I don't. That's been my mantra for 30 years. I'm happy to announce I just received a Drug Enforcement Administration license for psilocybin. I passed my background check. <laughs> woo <-hoo. laughs> But people oftentimes ask me, well, where I can get psilocybin? I go, I can't possibly tell you, but you have grandkids? How old are they? <laughs> 16 to 25, they probably know where to find some. Um, but a funny story about intergenerational and with children. I, I, my partner and I live on a remote island in Desolation Sound, British Columbia. That's where I spend 95% of my time. It's a very strange, it's a beautiful place, but then we get thrust into conferences. Otherwise, we live in extraordinary isolation. Um, and we, I have a boat, and I was over at a place that is a water access only tiny little village. And I was gassing up my boat at the dock, and I was, um, you know, I walking down the dock, and there was this like six, seven year old girl. She wasn't older than eight for sure, but you know, six to eight years old. And, and she's like, I'm walking down the dock, and she's there with her family that come in on a, on a little sailboat. And she just stopped in the middle of the dock and looked at me, and she goes, are you Paul Stamets? <laughs> I was going, wow, really? I'm in bumfuck nowhere, you know? <laughs> and I go, yes, and yes, and she goes, oh, I can't, I'm sorry. And so she ran back to her parents saying, oh, this is Paul Stamets. And then, so it was really nice meeting her, and she was really enthused, and so I said, and he, they go, we saw your movie, Fantastic Fungi. And I, and I looked at her, and I got, you know, she was really excited, and I go, what was your favorite part of the movie? And she goes, I like the part when the monkeys ate the mushrooms. <laughs> a little twinkle with the parents' eyes going, okay, <laughs> this is the next generation. So, But I do think it's multi-generational. And I say this with some chagrin and sadness. Before my father died, he asked to trip on psilocybin mushrooms with me. And Alexander Smith, who would like Daniel Stuntz, was one of my great mentors, who's the father of American mycology, published many new species of psilocybin mushrooms, many monographs, University of Michigan. And he also asked me to trip with him on psilocybin mushrooms. I mean, these are two very important men, and you know, literally father figures in my life. And with both of them, I asked the same question. And I said, okay. We could do this. This is, uh, can profoundly change you. You know, Helen, Alexander Smith's wife, she was also a renowned mycologist. I asked her and I asked my father's wife, um, will you also, you know, take these psilocybin mushrooms with us? And both of them said no. They wouldn't do it. And I said, well, I respectfully decline. I cannot give you psilocybin mushrooms, go on a journey with you, and at the end of your life, they're in their 70s, you'll have such a profound experience that I didn't want to drive a wedge in your relationship. And this is where I think ther therapists and psychiatrists are so important to create safe guardrails because these are powerful medicines. But what happens afterwards? You do this big, extraordinary journey, and then I disappear, right? And they're left holding the pieces. I didn't live with my father. I just on vacation. I go away in two days. Alexander Smith, I'd go away the next day. And then he would have to be trying to tell Helen or their partners you know, something that they couldn't fathom. And this is, I think, a really serious you know, question that we all face. These are such powerful medicines. What happens afterwards? Are you there for them? Are you skilled enough to, to help them process? And I think this is really, really important. It's, you know, it's not the journey itself. It's the path of the journey and subsequently that you be able, need to come to terms and be able to talk this out. So in the audience here, we have a giant in the Canadian psychedelic movement, and it's Dr. Pam Crisco. And she is part of the Canadian Psychedelic Association and a group called Roots to Thrive. They're doing group therapy, end of life, uh, despair, distress, anxiety, mostly stage four diagnosed patients. 
with Canadian government approval with high doses of psilocybin. Now this, I think, is a model and it's being replicated, so I want to give her a lot of credit. She's in the front row here. And many <laughs> but what they, what the, they have pioneered, which is really good, and with indigenous uh, input, et cetera, is that because this group of eight people, and they have eight you know, uh, you know, support people, physicians, you know, other people who are skilled in this, indigenous people as well, elders, but because they have a common you know, malady or, or you know, they have a death you know, sentence, the fact they all share this sort of like, oh my gosh, we're doomed to die very soon, because they could come together and prepare over several weeks, and then they shared this journey together, they became a community of people who could talk to each other hmm. when the other people weren't available, to build bridges and bonds, and to be able to have a common destiny that you shared together in this journey, rather than being alone, which is what my father and Alexander Smith would have faced, what a contrast. And so I think this idea of people coming together, not like going to Costa Rica or Jamaica and you're, you know, or you know, Cusco, Peru or something like this, and you walk in and you pay your, 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 your fee and you sit down with strangers. I think that's a formula for disaster. Um, because one person have a bad trip will traumatize everybody in the group and they'll, they'll go, WTF, we didn't sign up for this. They're making my trip really challenging. So I think having this shared common purpose, I think that model has extraordinarily powerful potential. So, Dr. Pram Crisco, thank you very much for your leadership. You're really doing something quite amazing, and, and they're publishing on this as well. So, thank you. And she'll be on a panel here tomorrow at 2.30 with me and Natalie Gakason and Xiao Zhe Hu, which is a women in the psychedelic ecosphere who want to talk about... Uh, Psychedelics for women, basically. Oh, but oh, men are allowed. Fu funny story. Also at 2.30 is the business of psychedelics 2.0 <laughs> at the same time. So it's okay. Either you want to like, you know, I don't know. If you, if you go Pink to mine, team or blue team. You, will be cancel you will be canceled if you go to mine. Uh, you will be canceled. And if you Pink go to pill Julie's, or blue pill, right? uh, you'll learn a if lot, you too. you know, if you're interested in yeah. capitalism, whatever. But yeah. we're going to be talking about yeah. actual <laughs> clinical things, so... That's cute. No, so I, 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 yeah, sorry, Dan, but I think it's time for women to take leadership. So I just think this is the time for I women self -cancel. to self cancel. I self cancel. Yeah. I self cancel. Uh, All right. I, I wanted to make sure that at some point I canceled myself. I feel, and I, you know, it's good. I have to say, Paul has been a tremendous ally to the women. There was, there was a mantle a few years ago, just as COVID was starting. The guys didn't realize there was like eight or nine guys on a panel at a consciousness. Um, conference, and I don't usually, I'm not the kind of person to, I'm just quiet and unassuming, I don't usually make trouble, but I emailed a few of them, because they were friends of mine, because it was like Paul Stamets and Andy Weil, and I just emailed a few of them, and I'm like, you guys, did anybody notice that like this is a total mantle? And the first person who responded, Paul was like, oh my God, no, this is terrible, you know, we have to change this, I'm going to bow out, we need more women, like, you, you were right there front and center, and I really appreciate that. And then they, well, they added Melania Trump, and that was it, right? That was the whole thing. Then co right. COVID came, yeah, and it right. got online, and you know no, the rest of the thanks. story. I just want to make sure at some point I stepped into a big pile of shit uh, for myself, and I'm glad I did. No, I, uh, either panel is going to be great, go to, go to hers, you can watch mine another time. Can we, can we just do this really quick? Paul, a uh, little break, because it has to do with movies. We don't have to go off on a big thing on it, but I'm just curious. You are a lieutenant commander, is that correct? Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, so chicken or egg question. Did Star Trek Discovery name a character after you because you had started exploring astromycology, or was the idea from astromycology inspired by Star Trek? I'm just curious. Actually, I've, I'm very happy to answer that, and I have actually an add-on as well. I was up in my remote island cabin, and CBS arranged a group call, and 12 of the writers from Star Trek Discovery literally said, Paul, we're in the dungeon. We're supposed to write the next Star Trek. We don't have the foggiest thing what to do. Do you have any ideas? And we're asking, wow, my cabin is built in the shape of Star Trek Enterprise. <laughs> The rafters are, are gills of mushrooms, right? 
and it's, it's, it's three hexagons in tribute to bees, and the big hexagon, 36 feet out, and the two 24s are shaped like a, like a starship. So I'm going, you've got to be kidding, right? And so um, I said, turn on your tape recorders, let me, let me rip. And so I, so I talked about mycelium, the organization of dark matter, computer, internet, neurons, all conform to, the, to this web-like structure, this interlacing networks. And I told him about, I believe that we'll find fungi throughout the universe. And, and I said, you know, I, I gave him this whole wrap, and I said, rather than, you know, going, at, going into hyperdrive and you see all the stars flash by you, if you can tap into the mycelial universe, you can instantaneously jump anywhere in the universe. So this is the advantage because the dark, the, the organization of dark matter, you know, is is this network that permeates throughout the entire universe. And so, you know, they go, oh my, that's great. And then I, towards the end, I go, you know, I always wanted to, I said, you can have the ideas for free. I don't want an acknowledgement. I don't want anything. I'm a Star Trek fan. And what I love about Star Trek is you set the stage on a model for future generations of tolerance, diversity, the prime directive, cooperation, bringing people together. This is a sacred duty that science fiction becomes science fact. You can lead people like myself. With, 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 I was hugely impressionable about the tolerance of diversity, et cetera. And then I blurted out, I always wanted to be the first astromycologist. They go, astromycologist? Astromycologist, we could use this. And then a little bit of the background, then two weeks before it came out, they go, uh, we we'll better call Paul, and they called Paul, and they go, hey, because I signed a contract, signed my life away, you know, they, they could do anything with my name, no money, no compensation, um, and they said, uh, you know, your character, Anthony Rapp, do you, do you mind he's, that he's gay? <laughs> You're asking me now, <laughs> right? <laughs> I said, are you kidding? That's a badge of honor. I have all my gay friends. I can tell them that I, you know, I've come out of the closet, right? So, <laughs> so you know, so then, then to, to finish the story, there's a, the first three episodes showed, and the astromycologist Paul Stamets is a total asshole. <laughs> so my friends call me up on, this is a, so damaging to your career and your reputation. So I call them up going, WTF? <laughs> What's going on? They go, hold on, hold on. So I told them about the mycelial spore drive beneath the creation of this chamber that you can fuse with the mycelium. So the astromycologist Stamets you know, goes into the mycelial spore drive and then bonds with blue glowing mycelium. Um, and then after that encounter, he comes out a really nice person. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we, we have two, two so, so I, I, I came out of the psychedelic closet, Paul came out of a different closet, Julie, any closets you want to come out of? Um, I, I was going to make the Star Trek zzzz sound when you said you came out of the closet, but I didn't. Uh, is there any, are there any closets I want to come out? Is that your question for me, moderator? I, I'm because sc- I, I don't even, say, I'm scared. No, I feel I don't like even. I already have. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've outed myself as a cannabis user, as somebody who tried MDMA, um, I don't know, a psychedelic parenting. I mean, I feel like I've, I've outed myself as much as I possibly can. Oh, we'll work on that. <laughs> um, uh, okay, uh, I, this, is, this is somewhere between, this is a question, this is a good Julie and Paul like dual question here because my, my first experience uh, was with uh, age, I'm 50, so this was at age 45. It was with MDMA. I thought it was gonna be with, with mushroom. I thought it was gonna be with psilocybin for a while because I, you know, done all my research and I'm an adult and I'm like, well, this is, you know, it's, you can't, it's non toxic. You can't, you can take as much as you want. I read Michael Pollan's book. It was with MDMA and it was the luckiest thing that, luckiest break I ever had. And I say that because I had an incredibly uh, profound experience with MDMA that led me to, led me to, the, to, to be able to be, I guess, brave enough to go down the mushroom journey. I have a very challenging relationship with mushrooms. They say, like, you know, you have a relationship with the medicine. It's a, it's a troubled relationship. Like, I'm still working on it. Um, what advice do you get? You know, there, there's this kind of everyone's jumping into, into psilocybin right away and, and that I see. And they're doing giant doses, and they are having challenging experiences. Where, where do you go with that? Because there's a lot of dogma. You have to start here. Then you do this, or you have to do that. And I think it's different for everyone, but I'm curious where you're at with that and where you're at with that. You're a little biased, uh, and I want to know. 
Um, this is what I do for a living. I mean, I, I do consultations with people who, are, you know, have a lot of questions. Should I microdose? Should I macrodose? What about ketamine? What about ayahuasca? What makes sense for me? Should I do MDMA first? Some people mix. Um, I, have, I have all kinds of opinions, and I don't think I can get into all of it now. I mean, I, my personal bias is that I think it's nice to start with MDMA because it's a little more of a subtle shift, and it's pretty controllable. And you can kind of get a lay of the land and figure out where the landmines are, where are the areas you need to work on. And, uh, you know, one of the metaphors I use with M MDMA is uh, it's like a, light, a house with all the lights on, all the doors unlocked. It's kind of up to you what closet you want to go into, what bed you want to look under. But you sort of feel competent and confident enough to do some exploring. But you're going to hit some places where you're like, oh, that's too big, and I don't know if I can do that, which means you come back to it maybe another MDMA session, or maybe you have psilocybin the second time. But the biggest issue now is that people are on psych meds, and it's really hard to advise people. It's hard to get off psych meds. It's hard to get off antidepressants in case you haven't heard that, I will tell you. So, um, and you can microdose even if you're on psych meds. You can have ketamine if you're on psych meds, but ayahuasca is not going to really be possible if you're on most standard psychiatric medicines. Uh, MDMA also often won't work depending on what meds you're on. And then psilocybin is a little more complicated. Um, but this issue of drug interactions is something that really matters to me. It is, it is you know, one of the risks because there are very few medical risks, but if you're on these meds and you mix with uh, these drugs, that's going to be a risk. So the biggest risk uh, is also just our drug policy creates risk, right? We don't know what we're getting, you know, the drug substitution, counterfeit. I mean, we really are having a crisis, obviously, now with uh, sort of the poisoning of the drug supply. So that's a big risk. But our drug policy creates some of these risks. And, um, and then some of the risks are just because, you know, as I love to say, people are going to people. Uh, there, unfortunately, is abuse, you know, Doctors abuse their patients, dentists abuse their patients, chiropractics abuse their clients, uh, the, the priests abuse their confessioners, you know, there's abuse in the military, I mean, it's everywhere. Uh, and it turns out is also not only in the underground psychedelic scene, but it's also in the clinical research psychedelic scene and in the retreat scene. And Nine Perfect Strangers uh, ha really did a bad job educating about consent, if nothing else. Let's just say uh, that was a little problematic. So, you know, I. I want there to be consultants on these shows. If I, you know, if I can't personally be involved, I, I would love to read a script and say, hey, this is dangerous, this doesn't make sense. Let's make sure that we educate people about screening and preparation and integration afterwards. And you know, these are all things uh, everybody needs to understand better. And keep in mind, all the clinical research, people are screened like crazy. If you have any history of a manic episode or if you've ever been psychotic or if you have a first degree relative who's ever had a manic episode or been psychotic, you can't be in that study. So after the studies and after the FDA approval, when it's more available and there's going to be less screening, I'm afraid, and unfortunately probably, uh, you know, trying to run more people at once because the two clinician, one participant model really isn't going to be cost effective. So there are going to be a lot of bumps in the road, and uh, I think it's reasonable that we prepare for them. If the pendulum swings so far that way, right? It, you know, in terms of in terms of um, warning and 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 letting people know about the harms. That's part of getting back to the movies and the and you know being on Joe Rogan and all that is the messaging. Where do you go with that? Well, um, I I, what I will want to say for the record, you should obey the law. Uh, the challenge that you face is, uh, do you obey state law or federal law? And those states that have legalized, like Colorado. Um, and so in Oregon, but, you know, I, we have, through our microdose.me study and, and doctors are, are collecting hundreds and hundreds of case uh, reports where people have gotten off their antidepressive medicines with microdosing. And so attentive physicians are always looking for these, uh, the N of one studies, one of these remarkable uh, breakthroughs that are not conventional, and they end up documenting it. There's actually journals, it was basically, uh, on best uh, out outcome cases where they were given a diagnosis for which there was no apparent remedy, and then you know, they stumbled upon something. So when you start getting hundreds and hundreds of these case reports, then clinicians wake up. They begin to look at this, saying, wow, 
there is something happening here. We need to study it. And so I think that's good. You know, with the grassroots movement is populating databases, giving information that physicians otherwise would not see if they only saw 100 patients a month and you've got 100,000 people reporting, now you're starting to see something and then clinicians pay attention for this. For people who, don't, who were not there yesterday, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, there's 120 clinical trials registered on psilocybin at clinicaltrials.gov. That's extraordinary. There was one back in 1999, right? Yeah. So, so that, that means that the people are paying attention to this. There is a lot of hype and high expectation, but as more of these clinical trials are published, it's you know, amazing to me that many of these high expectations, which seem to be extraordinary or even over-exaggerated, are now become substantiated. Alcohol use disorder, opioid use disorder, to kicking tobacco. I mean, this is, these are three yeah. different types of drugs, three different types of receptors, and yet is fundamentally changing the, the neurological health of these addicts. Uh, so the, the chorus of data is, is actually substantiating increasingly these extraordinary claims that heretofore were looked upon as being exaggerations, and it's, it's looking more and more real. Yep. On the other hand, People who have treatment-resistant depression, who've tried all these medicines and TMS and all these other things, and they come to psychedelics, and it's their sort of last hope, and of course this is going to work, everybody says this work, uh, and for whatever reason it doesn't work for them, um, those people are in a, a pretty bad state. And they are few and far between, but it does happen. There's, you know, I email you every once in a while about this, like there's some people who just don't respond to mushrooms. God knows... If Paul doesn't know, yeah. God knows <laughs> why some people aren't responding to mushrooms. And we do know, I, pu I published a paper about people who'd been on SSRIs for a long time. And when they came off of SSRIs to do an MDMA study, the people who were never on SSRIs had a big, robust response to MDMA. The people who had been on SSRIs who had come off had less of a response. I don't know if that's the case with mushrooms or not. I've talked to some underground people who feel like the people who've been on SSRIs for decades don't have a robust response to mushrooms even if they come off. I don't know if that's true, but I do know that there, I definitely know about people who came off their meds to have these experiences. It wasn't what they, I just talked to an underground person recently who, who got sort of some negative feedback from the person who complained, I didn't get enlightened, you know? <laughs> I thought I was gonna get enlightened. And, you know, it's not just a one and done. There's this whole process, and you may have to do it a couple times, and you need a lot of support between, and you need a lot of support after, as you said. Yeah. It's really this whole, you know, yeah. as much as people talk about integration, they throw this word around. It's the after that really matters. Well, there, there's also a fundamental flaw, unfortunately, with clinical trials. And it's extraordinary to me that more clinicians have not addressed this early on. Increasingly, they are. It's the placebo-blind double control. Right. And... You, the one group's supposed to get a placebo, and the other group gets a high dose of psilocybin. There's a great cartoon, many of you have seen it. I just love it. And the person, they're sitting in, in a patient group, you know, there are six of them sitting in their chair, and the other six are dancing around, you know, and they go, he, the person goes, well, I guess we're in the placebo group. You know, and this is a, actually a, an ethical issue because you're treating somebody with treatment-resistant depression. This is the end of the line for them. Nothing has worked. They're hoping they get psilocybin. Well, what's the ethical responsibility of the right. conditions that are exacerbating their depression? They thought they were going to get psilocybin. They get a placebo, and then they use that as a yep. baseline right. for the comparison of the people who have an improvement. I mean, it's, a, it's really yeah. fundamentally flawed, and there's 25 to 30 of these clinical trials that are using in, inactive placebos in contrast to high doses. I'm, I mean, this is just yeah. right. scientifically well, impunable, and I don't know how they got yeah. past the IRB boards on this. Yeah. And it's the hubris of scientists, especially scientists who have not tripped, right? <laughs> who they looked at this as some other type of medicine that they think they're the know-it-alls in designing clinical trials. And then I think it's, it's a serious, I would take every clinical trial with treatment-resistant or major depressive disorder that use a high dose of psilocybin with a placebo and you know, look at them you know, just very circumspectively as being you know, inflating their data 
because of the contrast. And what's the moral responsibility right. of causing these people to be more depressed because they were deselected? It's true that in some psilocybin studies, the only suicidality is really in the placebo group. It, group. I just said group. In the placebo group. Um, it's incredibly disappointing, right? And, and when people ask me about whether they should try to find a study or try to go to somebody underground, and we talk about all the risks and benefits of that, I talk about the fact that most clinical studies is a 50-50 chance you're going to get the medicine. So you have to be willing, you know, you're really doing it for science. You can't do it for you. Um, and I've been arguing against placebo in this forever. And I'm, I'm in the process of helping to design a study, very early stages of using MDMA in the treatment of people with schizophrenia. I, I refuse to have a placebo in that, that group. First of all, people with schizophrenia are sometimes pretty paranoid. I don't want to play games. Who's got the button, you know? They just... <laughs> So I think what we're going to do is everybody's going to go through with placebo first so they get the lay of the land and understand how it works, and the second time they will get active drug. And it, we'll just know it, and it's okay because you do know it. I mean, unless you're going to put dilating eye drops in every person, uh, which would be one way. I've, I've been talking about midriatic drops forever because to me it's a very easy, cheap way to at least make everyone look like they're tripping who's in the study. Can you explain that? I'm not quite familiar it's with it. It's an eye drop that dilates your pupils, so you get the big basketball pupils that one may get when they're taking a psychedelic. Well, that's psychedelic. good for the, the doctors looking at pupils. It would at least but be, what, well, it would at least help the doctors think everybody was tripping, but also, when you get that much light in, things look a little trippy. So it's something. Have you ever not gotten your pupils dilated for eye exam? Paul, you need oh, to yeah. go to the eye doctor. <laughs> no, no, I, uh, uh, it does, right, believe but me. It's a little I, reminiscent of MDMA or psilocybin when you get that kind of increased light coming in. Yes, but, you know, this is like even when people look at fractals and geometrical patterns, you know, it's just not it's like VR. And VR is a wonderful toy. Again, technology is getting ahead of itself. But with VR, it won't make you have the feeling of unanimity that wells up inside of you when you're tripping and you feel this yeah. one with the universe it's not just fractals and geometrical patterns and and visual effects it's something that's deep inside of your core that wells up and that is so different than what a vr experience can give and so these again clinicians that are yeah. using vr who think it's oh yeah we can induce a psychoactive experience well yeah. you can get part of the way there but it's not the same thing. Yeah, and also a lot of people don't have visuals or aren't very uh, visually oriented. There's something called aphantasia that a lot more people have than we realize. And it's uh, some people they can close their eyes and image. You know, they can they can visualize their mother's face or you know what they ate yesterday or something. Other people when they close their eyes to visualize, it's just black. That's called aphantasia. And so a lot of people with aphantasia don't have a lot of visuals anyway. So if they're just focusing on the pretty colors, they're really, they're certainly missing. I'm so neurotic. I think you just gave me a Fantasia. Like, I've been wondering why. It's, no, but for me, my first, go, well, go ahead. The, yeah, I, go. This go is ahead. by visual. This is a gr great short story. Uh, Terrence McKenna and um, Kristen Ratch and, and Edward, Eduardo Luna uh, and I were in Palenque. And um, we went to the ruins and um, we had a bunch of Cubensis. And, and for some friggin' reason, not a single one of us had a flashlight. Um, we went to the ruins of Palenque, and we all ate a whole bunch of Cubensis together. I mean, it was great. What a great group, right? And we're walking back to Chong Ka, the resort there. It was about two miles away, and we took the jungle trail. Bad idea. Um, and we end up, and halfway through, I mean, it is pitch black. We cannot, the type of trail walking where you're feeling with your feet, whether you're on the solid ground or you're off the path, and we're all staying close together going, this is crazy. And I go, wait, wait, I have my Nikon camera. I have a flash. You know, I can flash ahead and we can see the trail. <laughs> and so I said, wait. So I, I turn on my flash, you know, you know, the battery goes up and it says, okay, here we go. Ready? One, two, three, flash. <laughs> All of us going, oh my God, that was incredible. So we, <laughs> so we stopped in the trail. We all put our, the eight of us around in front of my flash. I go, here we go. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> and we we're just like, oh, this is the greatest shamanic tool ever, you know? <laughs> I, 
<laughs> I, I, I would want to put a, one harm reduction message in here. This, this is because uh, I think we're we're actually videoing this session, so hopefully, uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna have to do. We're, there may be some editing. We'll no. see what happens. No, 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 no. I'm with. Yeah. Nothing I said. No, I got you. Was illegal. No, 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 no. It's perfect. I, I'm going somewhere else here. I'm going somewhere else here. Ready? Okay. All right. The the story that that you've told, how you addressed your. Uh, your stammer, uh, you know, when you were younger, it's a, and it's a beautiful story. And in fact, before um, the session, there was someone that came up, came up to us in, in the green room and, and shared his his um, personal story of, of having a stammer and and was thanking you. And, it, and you took a you took some some time to talk to him, and it was very very meaningful. It, it, it reminded me of uh, you know of of why I'm what gets me excited about being in this field and in this space. But let me tell you something, that tree, going up in the tree, I have four boys, and I'm very honest with them about trivia. I just want to clarify, once and for all, are you ready for this? The tree, when you went up in the tree with the lightning storm, it was only like three feet off the ground, right? I mean, the branch was like right here, right? I just want to make sure. No, it was, oh, it, shit. It was, the, it was 50, right. 60 feet up. It was the all tallest right. tree. And, and Joe, no, you know what we're editing here? Yeah. But right, yeah. since you brought up the tree yep. and lightning, I want to share an epiphany with all of you. And my partner is very much a part of this experience because of this narrative. Okay, this is um, throughout the world, lightning strikes are associated with mushroom formations. In the Northern Plains, First Nations, the, um, the white circles around the teepees are puffballs associated with lightning strikes. In Ireland, in Europe, in Mesoamerica, all over the world, in Japan, in Russia, lightning stimulate, you know, it was thought to stimulate mushrooms to form. Well, there was a group in Japan that found 50 to 100,000 volts of electricity, one ten millionth of a burst, doubled the production of shiitake mushrooms. So lightning was proven, electricity pulses stimulate mushrooms. Okay, we carry that forward, and I'm thinking, and I'm tripping, and I'm thinking about the eight miles of mycelium, you know, underneath, you know, in a single cubic uh, f uh, inch of soil, every foot print you take, you're on 300 miles of mycelium. And I think after hundreds of millions of years of evolution, nature is smart, mycelium is smart, organisms are smart. If there's a lightning strike on the horizon, the flash of light, and you hear thunder. Well, mycelium produces mushrooms in response to four stimuli. A drop, a rain, of course, associated with a drop in temperature. Mycelium wicks up, exhales carbon dioxide, inhales oxygen, and light. So those are four prim primary stimuli. So I thought to myself, well, wait, with all these fibers of mycelium all over the ground, lightning strike in the distance followed by sound, low sound frequencies, wouldn't it awaken the mycelium? The mycelium's like strings on a piano, strings on a guitar. They're vibrating from these waves. That would alert the mycelium that rain is coming. And if the rain is coming, the mycelium wakens up to be able to absorb the moisture it's wicking, it understands that on the horizon, on the event horizon, there's water coming. Well, moreover, think about this with drum circles, with people celebrating the birth of a child, the death of an elder, the harvest of food. The mycelium is listening. And when people come together tribally and celebrate outside in nature with drumming and singing and toning, I believe the mycelium is sentient. It knows and is stimulated by these vibrations, which means the mycelium will grow, channeling more nutrients to the plants, to creating more herbs, more vegetables, more fruits. And that the mycelium is actually in the presence, as a presence of being that's surrounding us all the time. And I thought, oh my God, these lenses of mycelium everywhere are sound sensitive. They're not only responding to the impact of your footprints, not only responding to lightning, but are to our voices, to toning. And I think, I think that's really amazing. That is, I, thank you. I'm, what's that? Yeah, 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 I'm, get, I'm getting, thank you, by the way. I, that's, that was, that's. Beautiful. I have, uh, I have, some, I have, I have a gift for the panelists. Why? Because it's it's fun to give gift to the panelists. I was searching for something mushroom related. I had something really cool that I'm gonna tell you about later, but it's uh, it's it's too expensive. You may have to buy it on your own, but it's really cool. Um, <laughs> seriously, no. But 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 I I have this. I have a gift for the panelists, and it is a bronze. I had to write this down. Garuda opium weight, 
this is not a shameless plug for somebody's gallery who I'm very related to, but it's, it's very cool. It's from Southeast Asia. It's roughly 150 years old, and they were used to measure quantities of opium. Okay, so it's kind of a harm reduction sort of thing, right? I don't know how much it weighs, but um, it's pretty cool. I would still get your drug testing kits from Dance Safe if you are doing that, and probably by a good scale. But I thought this was pretty cool, and one for each of you. And when you uh, when you when you use it, just don't like whatever it is. Just make sure it's legal, and that you've talked to your doctor. But um, I want to thank, thank I want to thank Anna. both of you really um, for for your time and your stories and sharing your stories. It's what inspired me to get in this space. Um, change my life. I'm hoping that um, the work we're doing can can do the same for many others, and it's uh, it's you guys that made it happen. Um, I just want to remind you, if anybody wants, uh, I'm going to be at the bookstore right starting now, basically signing copies of Good Chemistry because I got to run. Sorry, I can't chat, but I can chat over there. And I'm doing a book signing tomorrow at one o'clock at the Host Defense booth downstairs. So, thank you all. <laughs> <laughs>